Hey there friends, Dave Politis, Canyon Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. And uh, this is a missing person segment, and uh, we're going to get into it today. We're going to talk about three missing person cases from the state of Vermont. When I first started this, I didn't really think much about Vermont. The more I got into it, some of the strangest cases ever came out of that state. And if you've read Missing 411 Eastern US, a lot of what I covered from Vermont is in that book. And we're going to we're going to go over 3 of those cases today. But got some sad news to report in the news, Missing Persons news. This came out of uh, Alaska, Dateline May 11th this year, USA Today. Title, U.S. Army Soldier Killed by Bear While Training in Alaska. It says, while training with a small group at Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson in Anchorage, Alaska, on Tuesday, U.S. Army Soldier was attacked by a bear and died from the injuries, JBER announced in a press release. The group was partaking in a training exercise in Training Area 412, located west of the Anchorage Regional Landfill on the 673rd Security Forces Squadron responded to the incident. The name of the soldiers being withheld. Search for the bears being made by the Alaska Wildlife, Wildlife Troopers, which closed the area to the public. Jay Burr stated that more details would be announced when available. KTUU reported that this is not the first time something like this has happened within the base's gates. On May 18th, 2014, a female jogger married to a soldier assigned to the base, surprised a bear with two cubs and was mauled on the base. She suffered lacerations on her neck, arms and legs and sustained a fractured neck and a torn ear. The Associated Press reported at the time that she curled into a fetal position, played dead, remained silent, actions that likely saved her life. The AP reported that 2014 bear attack revealed that an estimated 40 brown bears and up to 300 black bears migrate through the base seasonally. The Joint Army and Air Force Base covers 75,000 acres within the municipal limits of Anchorage. A bunch of questions come to mind. First of all, does the Army give the soldiers bear spray when they're in the woods? That's number one. Number two, a lot of times when the Army or the armed forces train, they don't use live fire. Uh, they use guns that shoot a laser, they hit a target, it radiates off, registers a kill. <clears throat> now, question is, what were they doing this time? They said a small group, and that's not good. As I've stated many times, when you're in bear territory, especially brown bear, grizzly bear, you have to pretend that that bear is always around and you need to have assistance there to cover and protect you. Now I don't care what the army says, they need to protect their soldiers. And if you go into an area, and I don't care any area of that base, right now there could be brown bear, grizzly bear in that area. They need to have those soldiers protected. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're going to go into an area unarmed and focusing on army drills and not bear protection, then you're going to leave your back end exposed. Who's watching that back end? Well, it doesn't look like anybody is. So they need to have people in there with real weapons to protect these soldiers. <coughs> Brown bears and black bears, two different kinds of bears, totally different mindset totally. A grizzly bear can attack you for no reason at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious about that. They could be walking along, all of a sudden they just look over at you, they don't like you, and they just take off and, and they'll try to maul you to death. And with a grizzly bear attack, you know it's a grizzly bear because right behind its head, near its shoulders, there's a big lump. That's one of the primary ways to tell the difference. And many times they're much larger than black bears. But if you get attacked by a grizzly bear, best thing to do, play dead. 
Grizzly bears not going to try to eat you. They're just going to try to kill you. And if they think you're dead, more times than not, they're just going to go away. You're going to suffer some serious injuries, but play dead. Black bear, entirely different. Black bear attacks you, they're going to try to kill you, and they're going to try to eat you. But they're not as tough <laughs> as grizzly bear. The experts say to fight off a black bear. And fight off means do everything you can. Kick, scratch, go for the eyes. I've heard people put their fists down a bear's mouth trying to pull their tongue out. I've heard all kinds of things. Uh, and when they say fight for your life, I mean fight like there's no tomorrow. Because that bear could kill you. But the chances are, if they're up against a vicious attacker, they're going to back away. Different entirely than a grizzly bear. So, I don't really understand how much training these military people are given when they're operating inside of bear territory like this. Especially now in the spring, bears are hungry. And uh, they're looking for food. And hopefully you don't get in their way. Now, there's a famous story told by Jack Hanna when he was up in Glacier National Park with his wife. And they're walking down a trail inside the park and they come around a bend and boom, right there is a thousand pound grizzly bear. And he said, he and his wife backed up to the ledge, the bear walked by, and that was the end. He said his heart was just racing a million miles an hour. There was no reason to deploy bear spray. It would have just aggravated the bear at that point. But yeah, it just it just depends entirely. Yeah, if you get attacked, it's just bad luck a lot of times. But in Glacier, uh, I won't go in there without spray and without carrying a big old gun. And uh, Angie carries a big old gun too. And uh, I'm not going to sit back and allow somebody to get mauled. I mean, a lot of times a bear can maul you and rip an artery and you can bleed out in a minute. So even though they may be gnawing on your arm, doesn't matter. You can bleed out quick. And when you're way out there in the middle of nowhere, not there's no help coming quick. Unless you're carrying a satellite phone, which is something else I talk about every once in a while. Satellite phones, different than cell phones. Satellite phone works off a of satellite. It can work anywhere in North America. And when we are in the middle of nowhere and I'm carrying a sat phone, you can't call 911 from a sat phone. It's a different service. But you have to put the phone number, the actual 10-digit phone number of the, sh of the county of the sheriff that you're in hiking. You call them and they're going to have, you're going to have to explain where you're at. And in northern Montana, we have something that's called Two Bear, like the number two, Two Bear Air. And it's, it's a free service. And these people run a 24-hour emergency rescue medical service that's uh, armed with paramedics. And they'll fly anywhere in northern Montana, Idaho, parts of Washington to save someone. They save so many lives. It's such a great service and it's something that's needed everywhere in North America. But anyhow, that's my story about bears. Next story. Hi Dave, first off, I want to salute you and thank you for what you do for those families of those who are missing. I'm sure they are beyond grateful. I'm grateful with all the information they gave us for all humankind, really. What you can never, what you can never be thanked enough. Thank you for all you've done as far as mental illness goes as well. As a special ed teacher, I've seen such a horrid rise in teenage mental illness in our schools. My own 15 year old son tanked when COVID first hit and he had to stay home from school when he had just turned 13. He seems to go in spurts, but when he does better and he's doing better and will miss and will be on meds and then self weans off 
to dismay us, his parents, and the doctor. It was always around the springtime that he seems to really bomb. His slump now, he's in a slump now and a depression has worsened, and now he is officially diagnosed as clinical. My husband and I are trying to now figure out what to do since we have other younger children to raise. And he is our oldest, so it's a bit uncharted for us. He has always been really good about being open with us, but lately he seems to shut us out more than the more we try to talk to him. But we would, but he would say we're talking at him. He's in danger of flunking in his freshman year of high school and losing his credits. We try to relay the seriousness of this decision, but he is totally apathetic towards us. My husband and I are hyper vigilant as we both have lost cousins to suicide. The one only recently being in the last year. It's hard to find people to talk to who really understand since you don't really bring up the topic of conversation as routine with mental illness. It's still very faux pas in our society. We have mentioned counseling, trying different meds, or trying different things to help us with his mood, but he doesn't take any advice from us at all. His high school is trying to help him, including his principal and teachers, but I don't know what, to what degree they actually truly understand. It also does not help that his aunt and uncle who live close by are now too busy with their lives since they've a had a child themselves and focus mostly on her. That rejection added to feelings of loss from losing both his grandfathers to cancer when he was young within less than nine months of each other and an uncle who died from repercussions of a plane crash between my dad's death and my father-in-law. There was also some major bullying going on between fifth and eighth grade that happened, which I don't think helped at all. He's always been super small as a person and would get made fun of over the years. And it's just added up in his mind. We are scared. We don't know what direction to turn to. We've thought about treatment programs, but he refuses. We've always been open about suicide with him because of the death of his cousin who died many years ago and she was not much older than him when he passed. And then when my other two cousins died, it just added more and more angst. Can you as a parent, can you as a parent and of a son with mental illness, please give us your perspective on what you have done. I realize you are not a doctor and I'm not working closely with a pediatrician. I feel like I'm slipping. We've only lived here several years and I'm not close to talk with others. My family looks at us as parents like, were defective. Yeah, I understand that. And they're very judgmental. We've always been looked down upon and we've tried taking them up, talking to them about this, but they tell us it's all in our heads. My husband's family is far too way, far away. We love them, don't want to lose them. And I get that a thousand percent. First of all, let me address bullying. It's a big problem. When I was a police officer, I had a, another officer named Joe Grasso who owned a gym in San Jose. And Joe had a bully program. He hated bullies. Joe was about six foot two, 250 pounds of absolute muscle. Nobody messed with Joe Grasso. There was a time when I was working, Joe worked in a different part of the city. Well, this one night he was working with me and I got a call of a family fight and I get there and I got three people that are just screaming at each other yelling and I'm trying to separate them. I'm the only guy there. Joe's the next guy to get there. He just walks into the family room and everyone just looked at him and stopped talking. <laughs> That's the intimidation factor of Joe Grasso. And he was a great guy. I mean, he's just a phenomenal person. So Joe started a program for kids about bullying because he hated bullies. And he gave me some good advice when I was a really young parent. And he says, you know, you really can't control how big your son or daughter can, will be, but you can control the mindset and their ability to respond to bullies. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. So what I did was when my kids were young, six or seven, I put them in a Taekwondo class, karate, Taekwondo. 
And I had them in that class multiple times a week for seven years. And both of them got their black belts. And both of them were very confident. They were very polite. It taught them honor, respect. It gave them confidence. And there was no doubt they could kick major butt if they had to. And uh, when Ben got older and he started to play in the U.S. Hockey League, USHL, they had to fight a couple times. And I can remember him telling me, he said, Dad, you know, the first time you really get hit in the face, it wakes you up. I go, yeah, I know. It does. Sorry about the dog in the background. One of these days you will meet her. I'm here alone, so I'm kind of babysitting. And there's not much I can do with her, so you're going to have to be patient. So, what I'd recommend is take your son and your husband and you and your son go to a NAMI, N-A-M-I, class. And I would say, I would explain to him that your rights are no greater than our rights. We have to live inside this house together. And I've done everything I can for you. And I think we as a team need to get together and work this out amongst all of us. And I need to be your advocate and you need to be my advocate. And once you get into this class, you're going to find out that you're going to have so much peer support, it'll blow you away. And then I would probably enroll them in some type of martial, martial arts class. He's a little older, but lots of time to catch up. Confidence and respect, a big deal in this world. And I feel really, really sorry for you, what you're going through. I understand, and I'm saddened by any family that has to deal with it, because the whole family are victims of this. Next story. I follow you and enjoy hearing your insights. I plan on ordering your book soon. I have a fascination with mystery and curiosity and seeing patterns. I think this is what draws me to your research with all the work you do and clusters and seeing your findings. For you people who don't know, we do sell a map of North America that shows every missing person's case and its name and its cluster and then the entire US, you can see it flow. I love the outdoors, walk, hike often. My husband and I bought land that we plan to build and live on in the future in Lilliwap, Washington. We love Washington State and go there as much as we are able to. I currently live in the city of Tucson in the unforgivable desert of Arizona. We look forward to trees and believe it or not, all the rain. I will take your advice to heart when our home backs up to the wilderness and we go on multiple hikes. We are taking a camping trip soon to northern Arizona and I plan on buying a bear spray and a locator beacon. I appreciate all your advice on enjoying and being safe in the wilderness. You can tell on how you conduct yourself that you truly care and respect people. Thank you. I have one story to share from when I was an adolescent that is similar to one you shared on YouTube. I was lying in my bed and I woke up with a feeling like a spirit thing. Something was all around me. I was frozen and could not move. I tried really, really hard to move and could not. I thought in my head that all I had to do was say the name Jesus and it would be gone. It took great effort, but I said Jesus in a whisper and it was gone. And I was no longer paralyzed or frozen. I know there are scientific explanations such as sleep paralysis, etc. 
Maybe that is all I was experiencing. However, from my personal experience, I know it has something more than that. I'm not as religious as I used to be, but I do meditate some. Thank you for having an open mind, caring for people, and respecting inter and respectfully interacting on your YouTube as you read stories and share input. Thank you. Yeah, that sleep paralysis, very scary. And lots of questions with that. Next email. Hey Dave, I'm a great fan of yours. I spend hours watching your videos. I'm very keen about the beings living all over the universe. Let me stop there for a second. So if you look at the screen you're watching right now, and where it says can am missing on the bottom left portion of the screen, if you click on that, that will take you to all of our videos, 250 some odd. It may click you to another screen, and then if you click on videos at the bottom of the screen, it'll take you to all of them. And uh, I have a lot that could keep you busy for months. Your channel fascinates me. Please kindly excuse me if I keep emailing you. Well, I just want to share the information that I know, which may assist you in your investigations. The beings from upper planetary systems are able to control the weather mainly by spiritual means and also by cities, S-I-D-D-H-I-S, and mystic powers. Being from lower planetary systems, they do it by mechanical means. But some auras and demons live on Earth are also able to control the weather by means of mystic powers. These auras and demoniac beings do feed on human beings and also use humans for sacrifice. They are bloodthirsty. Rakshasas are said to be large in size, big canine teeth, eyes are hot copper color, hairs do stand upright, horrible and fearful to look at. They use their mystic powers to disappear and cause disturbances to humans. You may believe it or not, we have to see these things from a spiritual perspective. Then we can see a clear picture of what is happening. Our body is made of five gross elements, earth, fire, water, air, and ether. These elements make up our gross body. On top of that, we have a subtle body comprising of mind, intelligence, and false ego. These two type of body covers us, the eternal spirit souls. On death, we leave behind gross body. Talking about other beings, they are like us. They have subtle body parts like us, but on a gross level, they differ according to their habits, planets, and some even have fur. Some of the spiritual side, so I wanted to read that. Next letter. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate you uploading these videos. Sorry for the long letter ahead. I have a few things I wanted to share. Firstly, I'm 16. I'm very happy to have been raised by a loving and caring family. You're lucky. Appreciate your mom and dad. It's the hardest job in the world. There's no book you can refer to on what's right and what's wrong. A lot of times you're just skimming along hoping you're doing the right thing. Tough job. By the way, it's one of the rare times I hear from somebody under 18. I'm not completely sure how I found your channel, but I've been watching you for around two years now. I haven't experienced my own to share as well. I live in a town about 12 miles from Pittsburgh, PA, as the crow flies. In October 2020, my sister and I and my grandparents went to a Keystone State Park farther away from the city. We're walking around the lake on a trail that goes through the woods. It was paved. And there was a little dirt path that branched off to the left and into the woods. My sister and I wanted to see where it went. We ran down the trail about 30 yards or so and came to a part where it went sort of downhill. There was a semi-heavy brush as it was fall. But we stopped at this point because I thought I heard something. We both hear it. It sounds like someone unexperienced playing a French horn or trumpet. We both looked at each other with one of those, did you hear that faces? It happened about two more times before we decided to run back to our grandparents waiting for us down the trail. The account only lasted 45 seconds to a minute, but my grandparents said that we had been gone for 15 minutes. Although we could see the trail where it met the paved path, it was odd. Also, Dave, my dad had a history, had the History Channel on last night. Ancient Aliens, Mount Shasta episode. 
there was an upcoming part about missing people and I thought to myself, I wonder if Dave will be on. After the commercial break, there you were. It was great to hear your voice somewhere else. So, Ancient Aliens, Vanished, My Show, uh, Skinwalker Ranch, those are all produced by the same company called Prometheus Entertainment. Very good company, put on some really interesting shows. Well, I have two accounts from my grandfather that I'd like to share. Me and my grandpa are very, very close. We spend much time together. Back in the 70s to 80s, not sure. He told me this a few years ago. He was deer hunting in northern Pennsylvania with his dad and friend. He was sitting up against a tree at about 5 in the morning. Yuck, I hate getting up that early. It was still dark. This thing comes crashing through the forest. It was at least a couple hundred pounds and stops dead in its tracks right in front of my grandfather. He had a flashlight, but was by himself. He didn't turn it on. I could hear the thing breathing and very, very slightly make out broad shoulder line on the thing. He says it definitely was a bipedal creature. Frozen in fury, sits there for a minute, couple minutes waiting for this thing to go away and it finally runs out into the forest. Uh, I got a question. <laughs> Why wouldn't you turn on your flashlight? Do you think the thing didn't see you? It stopped in front of you. If it only weighed a couple hundred pounds, most bear up here weigh way more than that, so why wouldn't you turn it on? Just a question. One last story. Sorry for the such a long letter. When my grandpa was in the army, he was doing shooting training at Fort Knox. Pretty cool. And his group of about 100 men are shooting at targets 100 yards away with dirt mounds behind it at night. This light turns on on top of the mound all the way at the other end. The commander says to cease fire. And this light, completely steady, makes its way along the ridge. The commander comes on a megaphone and says it will shoot if it doesn't show itself. They eventually unload fire onto the light and it stays on all the way to the other side of the mound and then turns off. On the last topic, I would like to discuss, well, hold on, what a stupid thing to do. Why would a commander in the military open fire on a light? You know, if there's intelligence up there, they're looking at this going, that's insane. Why are these people shooting at some light? What do we do to them? Anyhow, on the last topic, I would like to discuss teen suicide. Well, you know what? More, more teenagers need to discuss this topic in high school. Because I don't care what parents think. The topic is in their mind. And if you're afraid that you're going to bring it up and instill some thoughts, folks, it's already there. There's a student in my school named Redacted who sat behind me in English class committed suicide last month. A 16-year-old sophomore taking their life because they felt like they were a burden to the world. He was all smiles every day. I never saw him upset or in a low mood. He was hiding his darkest feelings. I felt as if I could have prevented it. I sat right in front of him. We all miss him dearly. He was a volunteer firefighter for two different departments in my area and he was a very good kid. So now, currently, my school is having guidance counselors talking about resources for mental health and posters all over the school for mental health. My school didn't do crap until someone does something. Somebody took their life for our school to then begin to do something about it. This outrages me. It outrages me. I'm truly sorry for your loss of Ben, and I can't imagine that you, what you endure. Nobody can. Don't worry. Thank you, Dave, for your time. One request. I have is that you can somehow make more content regarding Skinwalker Ranch as that is something that intrigues me. Well, here's the promise for that. I will review each Skinwalker Ranch episode in the news segments of this show. So if you see a news segment and it's a couple days after the Skinwalker Ranch, I'll be discussing it and I'll give it some critical review. So, 
the personality profile that this man described that took their life is exactly what happened up here in, in uh, Flathead County. President of the student body gave a talk to the class about suicide because another class member had taken their life. Talked about how important life is, how important sports is in your life, how important doing good in school. Stellar student, big athlete, student body president. Days after he made that speech, he took his life. Nobody could believe it. I've told you before, and I will say this again, and I'm going to keep screaming this because it makes me irate that our government is not relieving, releasing statistics for the last two years on suicides. And friends, they're not doing it because it's going to scare the hell out of everybody in the United States. And to think our government is sitting on this information and doing squat about it, just like your school, just like the school did, really gets me mad. Really gets me mad. I better move on or my blood pressure will go through the roof. Next story is from Sweden. Hey Dave, I hope you get to read this. First thing, my English is a second language, so my grammar is not the best. Your work is a true inspiration and life-saving. You're a very strong person, Dave. Me and my wife listen to your videos every day. I'm not that strong. Really not. I'm embarrassed when I break down in front of you. And I've tried really hard as time goes by to get stronger. But I'm not that strong. What you really see now is me at my best. I can kind of pick and choose when I do these videos and I try not to do them when I'm in a, in a depressed state. But thank you for that. I appreciate it. I want to tell you about this experience I had this weekend in Sweden. I'm 28 years old and I work in the metal industry. Staying fit and healthy has always been a big part of my life. And on my spare time, I like to go out into the hikes in different parks and nature reserves. I've had two unexplained things happen in my life with this encounter making it the third. When I was 14, my friend and I saw a big orb appear from nowhere in front of us. Well, there's a phenomenon where lightning makes orbs, so maybe you can explain it away with that. But that was also scary at the time. The second thing, I was 28, five years old, on a kayak trip with two good friends in Poland. We paddled for several days in the northern Polish forest, and at night we heard very strange ape-like sounds and everyone could hear it as well. Don't go canoeing in Poland these days. Now onto what happened to me this weekend. So I went on for a long hike alone and was planning to stay overnight in the woods. I got to this place near a lake with an amazing view. There was an old abandoned red traditional Scandinavian house in the middle of the woods. Must have been at least 100 years old and a strange stone formation in the woods. Reminded me of the druid circles with a strange pit in the middle. I was laying down on a hill I hiked up towards and was enjoying the view, but something gave me the feeling that if I stay here, something bad is going to happen. It really gave me the creeps, but I ignored my feelings and thought this place is so beautiful I'm going to stay here and I don't want to venture too deep. I had no phone signal or nothing at this point, and I started to remember that it was what we call Valborg in Sweden. In old Europe, medieval times and in ancient times, they called it Beltane, B-E-L-T-A-N-E. -E. And I know that these holidays, a lot of them have pagan origins, and I didn't think that it was this day until I was up at this spot. In ancient Europe, they did find rituals on Beltane toward or to ward off fairies. And it was said that the fairies were more open to contact during this time of the year and that you had to be careful. Anyway, it gets dark and I head to sleep as if the fire dies down. I suddenly wake up by this horrific loud scream sound. 
really gave me the chills to the bone just to write about it. The sound was so inhumane and terrifying that it sounded like nothing I'd ever heard before. <coughs> now I know that foxes and hares and some birds can make strange sounds, but this was loud unlike anything I'd ever heard. There's no way possible I could ever mimic what I heard. The scream had a strange metallic sound or hum and some kind of metallic vibration to it. And it had a predatory feel to it, it's the best way I could describe. And before I go on with this. The strangest sound that I've ever heard in the woods that I could definitely attribute to a mammal is a mountain lion. If you go to Google or you go to Yahoo, type in mountain lion sounds, and then you can listen to the sounds. It will blow your mind. And it's best that you listen to them now because if you're in the woods and you heard them, it would really freak you out. Hard to describe, but every cell in my body told me I, if I don't get away, something really bad is going to happen, and every hair stood up. The sound was loud and long, and it felt like it was coming from behind me. My cell phone was already dead at this point, and to be honest, to record it was never in my mind. I started praying in Jesus' mighty name to keep me protected, and I prayed nonstop. I took my knife and packed my gear as quick as I could and started jogging through the pitch black forest. It's a mistake. Never, ever jog in the forest when you think that there's predators around. That will instill, instill in them, oh, there's prey, let's go get it. I didn't have a light on me, and I got my lesson because I lost track of the trail in the dark night. Always carry a headlight in your backpack. Even if you're going to go for a day hike, carry a headlight, headlamp in your backpack. Advice. I became so scared of this strange sound that I felt so watched. I ended up going in loops, and it seemed to end up in the same place, even though I took on different directions. Well, it could have been the panic that made me disoriented and had me going in loops, but I couldn't help but think about stories of fairies making people miss time, etc. I prayed that I found the path, and I got this thing out. After several hours of fast-paced walking and jogging, I finally laid down from exhaustion and had to get some rest. I woke up early in the morning and hiked back to civilization. Never been so glad to see human buildings, etc. in my life. Thank Jesus and got out, and I'm sure the prayers is what saved me. Interesting. So, on the headlamp, I'm serious, buy one, get one, and do your research before you get one. Most headlamps are rated on lumens. That's the, it's a way to categorize how bright of a light it will project. Get one that will project the lightest, brightest lamp. Because when you're on a trail and you're walking along, you want to see out as far as you can. Now myself, I have never purchased a headlamp that was working off a recharged battery. The reason for that, once you're out of battery, you're dead in the water in the woods. So I carry one that has batteries attached to it and I carry extra batteries. Just a thought. So that's enough for that. We're going to talk about three missing person cases from Vermont. First case is one of the most famous I've ever written about. It's in Missing 411 Eastern United States. And it involves a girl that was in college. Her name was Paula Weldon. Let me say something. Paula came from a very, very good family. She had two sisters. <coughs> Her dad was an engineer. She was a sophomore at Bennington College, Vermont. Bennington is in the far southwestern portion of Vermont. And she was a hardworking girl because she worked her way through college by working in the halls at lunch and at breakfast. Not a very glorious job. Some would say it was demeaning, but she did. She had good grades, she was smart, and she worked hard. Well, she was a sophomore, December 1st, 1946, 
it was a Sunday. She got done with her lunch shift, and she was she grew up in the outdoors, and she wanted to go take a hike. It was a nice, brisk day in Vermont. Well, she found a friend who found a friend to give her a ride about 10 miles out into the woods to this spot, to a trail she knew about. And this person gave her a ride and she told her roommates and such that she'd be back later that afternoon. She didn't come back. Well, that instigated a massive search. Now, this is the original missing persons poster on Paula Weldon. Had some close-up shots, tall shot. She was in good shape. Some would consider her an athlete for 1946. Her dad, when she didn't show up that night at the dorm, her dad was called. And her dad didn't live very far away at all. And he responded. And right away, that late that afternoon, they started looking for her. And Paula would best be described as highly intelligent, inquisitive, hard worker, liked people. She was wearing a bright red coat the day she disappeared. Her parents lived in the city of Glastonbury, not far away. Now, I did a little different with this map. So Paula was going to Bennington College right here, and she went to the Long Trail here. And again, this is a pretty popular trail. I printed the map like this because I wanted you to see this still is ultra thick forest. Super thick forest. They've never been logged. It's amazing. So, they start doing their research. At the time in 1946, Vermont didn't have state police. They had another category for it. And the city police started to take control of the situation. And they found some witnesses on the trail that saw her at the trailhead starting to walk up into the woods. Some people said, several people said, that the trail goes along near this very swampy area and near the back of that swamp they heard a woman scream super loud they said that there was no way that they understood how someone could get into that area but it was a scary scream that was the first thing that was reported now searchers went into this region to search Several reported a smell of death, of something dying. And they smelled that multiple times. A couple of things about this. The theory behind the police was they searched for her for three weeks. Massive amount of effort went into this. They said it's possible she was dead on the mountain somewhere but if she was she was carried away because they couldn't believe that she'd still be there and now you look at it 70 80 years later and paul has never been found nothing related to her has never ever been found and a red coat which would stick out like a sore thumb has never been found Why is this different? Many reasons to me. First of all, the odor is unique. You don't smell that very often in the woods. Number two, I've stated all along that water is key on my cases. Now they had canines that they brought in, couldn't pick up a scent. It rained multiple times during the first week of the search weather. Hearing a scream from an area that people would describe they don't know how to get into that area is troublesome. 
To think that Paula would have tried to work her way into that region on a December afternoon is ridiculous. So what happened? That's a million dollar question. Now this area that she disappeared in, hers was the first of a series of disappearances in this area that I wrote about. I'll tell you about one other one, and that was happened about four years later, October 12, 1950. A young boy named Paul Jepson, same Bennington area where Paula lived, was going to school. And this happened at the city dump in Bennington. And I tried to understand where the dump was at that time in 1950, and I couldn't figure it out. But his parents were school teachers. They wanted the rural lifestyle, so they bought a rural ranch. And they raised 100 head of cattle. And they also had 100 head of, or 100 pigs, and a farm. And back then, apparently, they got approval from the city of Bennington to let the pigs graze at the city dump. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Well, the Jepsons had two kids. They had a daughter named Nancy that was seven, and they had a son, Paul Jr., that was eight. Well, on October 12th, Mrs. Jepson, every day, would go to the dump and move the fences so that the pigs would graze in a different area of the dump. And she pulled up that day at about three o'clock in the afternoon, parked near the forest line of the dump, left Paul in the front seat of the truck, and went to move the pigs. She came back 30 minutes later, and Paul was gone. Paul had never left the truck before. He knew never to leave the truck. She ran around the area screaming his name. He didn't respond. She went to the dump office and called her husband, who in turn called state police and fish and game. It was now about 4.30 and resources started to respond to the dump. Well, the first people to respond were local deputies and wardens. This was at the base of some of a location called Bald Mountain. Paul Sr. thought that it might be possible that her son, that the son, Paul Jr., got out to walk in the forest to look around. But nobody would believe that he would climb Bald Mountain so it was hard to understand where he went because it was all uphill. Well, the search included canines, the US military, public servants from the city of Bennington, police, fire, the parents, they brought in a helicopter from the Coast Guard and it was a two week search. They didn't find anything, nothing. They couldn't believe it. Canines never picked up a, a scent trail. People were absolutely mystified what happened to Paul. Mrs. Jepson said that at the time that Paul disappeared, there wasn't one thing unusual with the pigs, with her, no unusual sounds, feelings, nothing. And nothing was ever reported. Now, it was at about this time in 1950 that the newspapers started to pick up on the fact that there were multiple people starting to disappear in this area of Bennington. And they started to pay close attention to it. Now, one case that wasn't real close to Bennington but essentially got no press at all, and I doubt you've ever, ever heard of it, and it, you won't find it on the, on the web until now, because we're reporting it. So about 100 miles away, 100 miles north of Bennington, 
near the city of Burlington, Carl Ross, 27-year-old deer hunter, went missing November 17, 1957. He had a really good job. He was what was called a tester for General Electric. He and his wife and two friends decided to go deer hunting near a location near the city of Ripton, R-I-P-T-O-N, and they were on the mountain, Ripton Mountain. So Carl was going to be near the bottom of the mountain, and it was his turn to have the deer push towards him. So his wife and a couple friends were pushing the deer down towards Carl. What's fascinating about this is that in Missing 411, The Hunted, if you haven't watched that movie, please do. You can watch it for free on YouTube. I talk about a story where an 80-year-old hunter is seated and his relatives pushed deer towards him while he sat there and he disappeared and was never found. In this case, Carl, 27 years old, is sitting down at the bottom of a canyon and they're pushing deer down towards him. Well, <clears throat> at three o'clock, they all agreed to meet back at the truck. Carl didn't show up. And that was odd. So the forestry service was called, police were called. Everyone responded. A search actually started late that first day on November 17th. They started calling his name, looking around. They actually thought that this was gonna be a fairly short search short search because it wasn't that far into the wilderness. Well, on the 19th, two days after the search started, they had brought bloodhounds in. And after the bloodhounds arrive and start to work, heavy rain started to fall. And they, they described it as a heavy rain. Well, Search coordinators brought in Ethan Allen Air Force Base helicopters, state troopers, University of Vermont, and Middlebury College students to form into groups to search. Fish and Game brought in multitude of searchers from throughout the state. For 10 days, they had upwards of 250 searchers in the field looking for Carl Ross. Near the end of the search, the, the search coordinator made a comment. First of all, it's Carl. Made a comment that they found it highly, highly unusual that he didn't walk his way out. And they said because from where he was, he could walk a half an hour in any direction and hit a road. And they said that if he didn't try to walk out, which meant that he was seriously injured, they should have found his body. And they were convinced they would have found the body if he was there. Now, there were articles over the years. Let me, let me hold this out for you and explain. So this is Burlington up here. This is uh, the Vermont border. And it's right along this border that uh, Paul Weldon disappeared down in this area. And this is ripped on where Carl disappeared. And again, this area is just super thick wilderness. So his wife gave multiple interviews over the years. She was on the hunt, which was pretty unusual. She was there with a couple of other of his friends. She was one of those people pushing the deer down. Over three or four years, there were six to eight different searches for Carl. And the hunters that hunted this area were actually briefed by Fish and Game and asked to keep their eyes open for any unusual clothing, etc., that they saw on the ground. Well, 
It's now been over 65 years, and Carl Ross and anything associated with him has never been found. Doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense at all. And I'm sure that law enforcement was absolutely stymied with a half a mile in any direction you're going to hit a road. And if you had 250 searchers, you could cover that half mile with 250 searchers at five foot increments between each other. You can cover that ground pretty quick. And I'm sure that they did because they searched for so many days. But then you have to remember that it isn't just Carl Ross, but it's also Paula Weldon. Now, in Carl's disappearance, they didn't have any screams or unusual smells like they reported on Paula's case. And on Paul Jepson's case, there was nothing along the lines like Paula's case as well. They didn't have anything. Now, you think that a boy who disappears in 1950, hunters would have found something related to that boy over the years. But again, nothing. Now, these three cases. So one, you have a hunter that's 27 years old. Okay. Used to the outdoors. Familiar with that world. Two, you have a college student, sophomore, 18 years old, that grew up in the woods. Knew it well. Comfortable there disappears, alone, gets dropped off at the trailhead, is seen at the trailhead by others, starts to walk, disappears. Point of separation. Carl Ross separates from the other hunters. Point of separation. Paul Jepson, sitting in the front seat of a truck, his mom walks away to move the fences with the pigs. Point of separation. Disappears. Never found. Eight-year-old boy, 18-year-old lady, 27-year-old man. Quite different scenarios with each one. All of them have one commonality. Disappeared in the far western part of Vermont in very rural areas. Very little to no evidence no canine scent trail. Weather played a role in each of these searches. Point of separation. I could go on. Frustrating, friends. Very frustrating. You know, Vermont has a very relatively low population. And these disappearances happened within a pretty tight time frame from the 40s to the 50s. And all of a sudden they stopped. Very strange. So, that's our show. You do me a huge favor by passing this on, telling your friends that uh, I do give hiking advice and safety information that this could happen to anybody and it has happened to anybody over the years almost every state in the union so I greatly appreciate you being here do something nice for someone today when you go out and you're in the public hold a door open say good morning say good afternoon do something nice. Our world is deteriorating fast. We need to stay positive. We need to look forward. We need to take care of each other. And we need to be prepared. And I've told you about preparation before. Please be prepared. I'm not trying to instill fear. I'm trying to instill rational thought. Everybody has said that their prices are going to keep going up and our food is going to become more and more scarce. Be prepared. Thanks for being here. We 
greatly indebted that you sit here and you, you listen to me every couple days. It's a, a, a very rare opportunity to be in front of people who actually care. And I'm grateful. Thank you. Polite us out.